Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us at Mind the Gap, an initiative at Mill Valley Film Festival. Um, right before this, you probably saw our land acknowledgement in our anti-discrimination statement. We wanted to make sure that each one of these conversations was a safe space. And we, of course, wanted to acknowledge that we are on ancestral lands of indigenous community. And that is something that's really important to us here at the Mill Valley Film Festival. So thank you so much for reading those. And thank you so much for joining us again for Mind the Gap. Uh, this conversation is uh, the evolution of Black women's roles on screen. And I'm so excited to be here for this roundtable um, with our amazing uh, guests. Um, we have Ekwa Masangi. Hello. Ruth Carter. And Lorraine Toussaint. <laughs> um, so I'm so excited to have all three of you here for this conversation. I am huge fans of all of you. Um, I feel uh, very blessed to be here. Um, so I'm gonna just start with the conversation uh, start with a question and kind of get the conversation going. So what was the first black woman um, all of you saw on screen? Um, anyone can jump in. Diane Carroll mm. in Julia. I was a little, uh, little black girl in Trinidad and uh, televisions had just had finally come to the island and I think there was Bonanza, Dr. Kildare, <laughs> and Julia. And so um, whenever I, I saw Ms. Carroll, and I was blessed to see her fairly often, and I would forever thank her because when I declared at 11 years old I was going to be an actress, and some of my family members said, what are you talking about? Have you ever seen a black actress? I was able to say, yes, <laughs> Diane Carroll. Um, and I, I held on to that for a very long time. What role did she yeah. play? Saw her on screen for the first time. What role was it? it was she, was, she was playing Julia oh, yeah. in, in a, in, I think she was the first black woman to have a half hour comedy, yes. a half hour show on a network uh -huh. called Julia. She played a single mm -hmm. mom mm -hmm. and she was a nurse yeah. and she had a little boy named Corey. <laughs> That's right. And they had a great relationship. I remember that. And was it James Earl Jones was her like love interest? Yes. He was young and handsome. It was a real <laughs> That's exactly right. Yeah. That that changed that rocked my yeah. world. Yeah. It was my so first, beautiful. Uh my first uh person black of color, woman of color that I saw on screen. I think it's because, you know, when you when I was a kid, we would watch all those comedy shows like laughing and and uh, so and, and as a black family, you know, it's multifaceted uh, with music and, you know, R&B. So when the Supremes got their own TV show uh and they it, and uh, uh, Diana Ross was kind of this comic uh character and i i just saw this woman who i thought was you know she could sing she was the lead of the supremes the supremes were beautiful women um they had great clothes i remember all of their clothes they were like mm -hmm. dolls. and then there was diana ross who i never knew was so funny and <laughs> So that, she kind of was that iconic, like, I want to be like her image that, mm -hmm. that I remember growing up because we could watch all those comedy skit shows, you know, and laugh and laugh yeah. with them. And she, she actually had her own, the, her own show too. So, I, you know, through the years, I've kind of been connected with her for some reason, like Lady Sings the Blues is one of my favorite movies. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Bob Mackie did the costumes, and so her, her looks were all so wonderful. And then she was nominated for an Oscar. So, you know, she was that, that woman, that Black woman that I saw that had so many layers, as well as the Julia, uh, Julia TV show. But yeah. I think as I became a teenager, I started seeing more like Diana Ross. 
That's so interesting because I feel like, so it's all, basically all of us are having TV moments. I guess that's what was common at the time. Mine was, I was, I grew up in East Africa and I think my first recollection is probably Claire Huxtable, Um, you know, the Cosbys, because that was the one show that we had, like, aside from like the news, you know, that was local, but everything else, you know, in terms of a drama, there was... The Cosby Show, mm-hmm. and so Claire Huxtable, and I'm curious, Lorraine, for you because I loved Claire Huxtable, and I thought she was funny, and you know, Kenya, mm-hmm. uh, similar to Trinidad, is also English speaking, so it's not like I had language barrier, but there was probably many things that were completely over my head because I'd never been to New York or Brooklyn or. You know, I mean, like I didn't quite understand the world, but I, I guess, understood it in terms of like what they were doing. And I'm curious as to what your experience was, especially loving acting. Like when you saw Diane Carroll, were you aware of the surroundings and maybe the issues she was discussing, or you know, or how how much of that do you remember being aware of? It was it just the impact of seeing somebody that looked like you? <laughs> There were things that were foreign to me, like snow and um, <laughs> um, apartment buildings, and they lived in an, yeah. they lived in, the, in an apartment building. Um, and this really is, is is going deep into my childhood psyche. But um, I remember she looked like my mother and my aunts. Mm-hmm. Because she had a, a level of sophistication, and I was the middle class Caribbean, middle class colonized mm-hmm. is a very particular thing. Indeed. And so it's it's one of the things that's taken me the journey that, that has taken me on. You know, you dance with the lady that bring you to the party. That's just it. Because one of my, <laughs> I have to laugh at myself. One of my first words as a child was Vogue. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And that tells you everything, right? But what it does tell you, what it does yeah. mean is that I was I was growing up at a at a time when all when those women made their own clothes, Miss Ruth. And so there was a moment when all the patterns flipped from butterick and simplicity to vogue pattern uh-huh. Uh-huh. and all the women in my family were just all about vogue patterns oh. and, <laughs> and and the whole vogue line had a certain it it had a certain it was different from simplicity and uh-huh. so <laughs> there was a kind of sophistication that Diane Carroll had uh, in her clothes and her carriage that spoke to the highly colonized women I came from who were mm-hmm. more British than the British. Mm-hmm. And then you add that black Vogue thing to it. Um, <laughs> she was the girl that I, she looked like one of my aunties. Yeah. Um, so Good Times was less, was more foreign to me than mm-hmm. Diane Carroll was. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's so great. That's so great. Yeah. That's where you get all that style from. I know. From, from, <laughs> from, from the cradle. There's <laughs> nothing I can do about it. I can cuss as much as I want to cuss. It still comes out sophisticated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I do my best. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it is what it is. It is what it is. You know, I'm. I'm as real as it is, but you know, yeah. I can't help it. <laughs> yeah, I think, yeah, that, you're right. That colonized experience is very specific. Yes, um, and and I'm just, it's, it's great to hear you talking about it because I've certainly thought about it a lot for my context. Um, and then also found out that it's very true for a lot of African-American people too, where I, I grew up not seeing anybody that looked like me really. Um, you know, I, the Cosby shows came on, I think, once a week. So yeah, that it's was not cool. like, <laughs> and these were like really old reruns and they didn't necessarily play them like 
you know, whatever. Order, right. So who knows what you're going to get. And so, you know, so there wasn't, I mean, I think it was probably at least 10 years until we saw Sarafina that came out. Yeah. And I mean, that was huge. Sarafina, it played for only two weeks, mm. you know, in like one, maybe one theater in town. And we like, I mean, we were around the block for like four or five hours trying to get into this thing. And that was the closest to anything that was actually about us. And it was South African and we didn't, you know, speak the language, but we spoke the language. It was, it was fine. It was close enough. We get it. And there's Whoopi Goldberg and everyone was just like, all right, whatever, whatever we get her. Like she, we get, she was the money person, but let's really get to these other kids, you know? And that was, that was a huge, huge moment. And I actually wrote something about that, um, about that moment, um, you know, being able to see oneself and in relation actually to Black Panther, um, Ms. Ruth, because we we're talking about that too, and like the power of seeing one's own culture, or at least something similar represented on screen and what that does, it's kind of like it opens up your eyes to like the possibilities of like, oh, I could be, I could be there too. I don't have to just watch other people on screens living their lives and telling their stories. Like my story could also be a part of that. Um, and that was really instrumental for me as a filmmaker. Um, I never wanted to be a performer, so bless those of you who are, but <laughs> as a filmmaker, that was always, that was a very key sort of turning point for me. Yeah, my turning point as far as images and uh, our cultures was Vanessa Williams. Um, when yeah. I was graduating from college, she had gotten her crown as the uh, Miss America, the first black Miss America, and she was, light skin with green eyes and sandy hair and I totally you know related to you know that image because you know I'd struggle with being you know a black woman that was light you know and feeling very connected to my culture because of my my family background and so on but um, not really ever seeing myself embraced or mm -hmm. recognized and then she uh, Vanessa Williams fell from grace her she did that uh, series of nude photos and they stripped her crown from her I mean now we live in a time when you do a uh, nude video and not, you're a superstar um, but then they, they right. tore her crown from her head because she wow. showed herself nude and that, I remember that really impacting me like really uh, frightening me because I mm. was studying to be an actress in school and um, it wasn't until like my junior year that I start delving into costume design and you know found it was a way that I could express myself artistically and so I was kind of weighing them both out you know which one I wanted to do and be, when that happened to her I decided to go do costumes uh -huh. I felt like the world was not ready for someone who looked like me and mm. that's what I said to myself at that time that you know um when they were looking for a black person to play a certain role, they really wanted someone brown, not someone light with green eyes. So, um, and then when I moved to Los Angeles, I went to a talk that she gave, that Vanessa Williams gave, on you know overcoming adversity, uh -huh. and I knew exactly what it was going to be about. And I went and I went, felt so like filled with her courage. Uh, and she was there with her first husband and she was talking about the experience publicly and she still had so much dignity and, and I still looked up to her and, you know, really felt like, you know, it doesn't really stop anything that you want to do. You know, she yeah. was, you know, an, an example of that. So interesting. Like, you know, what that generation sort of had to face. I mean, everyone has had to face certain things along the way, but um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's interesting. It's like your, it's your, your personal private journey through, yeah. you know, inside and outside, you know. Yeah, and like the specifics of, you know, as, especially for women, like, how what's considered vogue what's considered beautiful what's considered you know i feel like 
when you deal with white women, you know, they can be just really amazing performers. They don't necessarily have to be the most beautiful woman or the most mm. svelte woman or the most this. I mean, there's also a lot more roles for them to play or have been, um, but hope things are changing for us. Yeah. Um, but it's just, it's interesting to think about like the women who were present and what they were able to do with like, the tiny slice that they had um, mm -hmm. and the kind of inspiration that they gave to people all over the world, literally all over the world, you know. When you think about incredible. like Sam Greer, our iconic images, Dorothy Dandridge, you know, um, they're beautiful. Roz Gash. Yes. And you know, beautiful and yet they had so much substance and yeah. that's I think that was the takeaway for for me and I feel like for most people of color, you know, the takeaway is we see more than just what meets the eye. Mm -hmm. we, we actually can relate to it on different levels. You know? Well, we kind of have to pack it in, you know, we, we don't have the opportunity to just come to the table to say one thing. Right. So with the, my lines, I'm bringing in all the history and all the things that haven't been said that we've been needing to say and meaning to say. Yeah. Um, and we get it. I don't know that everybody else does, but that's fine. The purpose is for us to get it, you know. Yeah, it's the, also like the political screen, you know, with yeah. uh, Shirley Chisholm and, you know, all yeah. of these things were happening simultaneously. And it mm -hmm. was a time of, you know, through the 60s and 70s of, you know, burgeoning, you know, black culture re reignited, you know, and, you know, we were caring about being more authentic and, yeah less like you know the cookie cutter 1950s yes so i think though those images on screen definitely coincided with the entertainment industry mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure for sure yeah you said diane carroll were there any other um individuals that like inspired you to go into acting lorraine and then frack rock who was it claire huxtable that made you want to be a filmmaker i know you said vanessa williams were there any other inspiration mm -hmm that like moved you towards your path in the year. Of course, early Ruby D and um, Dorothy Dandridge and, and I watched a lot of musicals, mm -hmm. um, Lena Horne and um, even Ella was in there. I, I, I looked for all the black characters in the early, those musicals of the 40s and, and, and 50s. And then of course, um, Diane Sands. Oh yeah. Oh my gosh, she was she. I could see myself in her, and she had such a short-lived career. Um, and of course, there was Diane Carroll again and Claudine. You know, I'm actually mm -hmm. hoping to do a version of Claudine before I'm too old. But it's um, you know, these were I can't. I mean, I I remember Diane's um. Roz Cash, who, when in the 90s, I had dreadlocks and, and Roz and I was the first black woman on a series with dreadlocks. This must have been 1990. And because before then, Roz Cash grew her locks and couldn't work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And they, they, she literally stopped working. They wouldn't hire her anymore. Oh. And so um, I've always been very, very grateful to Sister Roz because I'm on her shoulders, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm on her shoulders. There's so many shoulders that I stand on that um, it's almost impossible to choose one, but I would say Diane Sands she was she was sexy and urban and she was fierce and she could and then there was young ruby in 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 in, in um, raisin in the sun you know and those were images that invited me to become a dramatic actress as mm -hmm. opposed to in my early training where there was a belief that you had to sing and dance and act and do it all I remember early, and I mean early, like maybe before 15, deciding, no, I was not going to do it all. 
I was going to do what Diane Sands was doing. I was going to mm -hmm. do what those girls, what those women were doing. Ruby. So. Well, a lot of people think that I got into costume design because, you know, I liked fashion, high fashion and things like that. But it really was like, you know, the poets and playwrights that um, I read as a kid. Uh, I was a huge fan of Sonia Sanchez. I recite her poetry to this day. Um, Nikki Giovanni. Oh, yeah. My mom um, and my aunt, they liked uh, Miriam Makiba. They used to listen to her, infant eyes, and they'd sway, you know, in the living room to her beautiful voice. And so, you know, I was looking at like album covers and um, my mom with the church would take me to New York and I saw for Color Girls. So I knew who Itazaki Shange was and I knew she, she kind of looked like me. And I had... Um, I had like a multitude of places to go to find, um, you know, to find that place in my heart that relate that I related to, and um, um, I was in a lot of programs. My mother got rid of me every summer. Like, I was like, "Hey, what's going on?" I thought I was staying home, but <laughs> I would go to these enrichment camps, and and they were called like Uhu Sasa and. Uh, we were united with uh, college students from the five college uh, area of uh, Northampton and Amherst, and they would give us remedial uh, schoolwork, but also teach us about African dance and drumming, and they would, you know, introduce us to um, the poets and the playwrights, and we do plays and. So I got a nice uh, dose of the other side of the coin um, besides what was happening on our television set. Um, my mother was not big on TV. Like if our TV, you know, we had the one with the big bubble, you know, the big bubble in the front, you know? And uh, so if the picture was bad, my mother was not concerned. <laughs> I know we are doing the wire. The rabbit ears. <laughs> You know, so I got, you know, I got to uh, explore other images of womanhood and other stories of courage and and, um, and art. And those mm -hmm. were the ones that I clung to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's so great. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I unfortunately I did not have the same experience in terms of the richness of culture that I was able to experience growing up, certainly not on TV. We did not get that at all. In fact, it was the exact opposite. We just got like really, you know, like British top of the pop type things or just like, I don't know, I need to do research. There are some American movies that I'm sure are never seen anywhere in America and I don't even know who's responsible for them, but they're like D-level movies, they're kind of like Rambo ripoff type films that just flood. Rambo was just, we probably watched Rambo for about 15 years. It was just so, wow. so sad and pathetic. <laughs> oh Lord, so we just didn't, we didn't have that. I mean, I'm the, the first memory that I have is a late night screening of uh, School Days, Spike Lee's School Days, actually. Oh, yeah. And I must have been about maybe nine-ish or so. And the presenter said it was a black filmmaker, um, you know, who's was a new filmmaker, Spike Lee. And this was the film and it was, you know, I was young, it was late night. I didn't quite understand all the politics and the story, but it was the first film I'd seen that had all black people in it and not wow. black people who were servants to white people or, you know, do, doing things for white people were kind of in the background, which is kind of the only way that black people were ever seen at that, at least, you know, in any of the shows that I watched. Mm -hmm. um, but they were like just black people with their own stories. And so that stayed with me. And, um, and then some years later we had Sarafina. And so then it was like, oh, I could do this. But I went, I became a filmmaker in opposition to or in reaction to all of the films that we didn't have, all the stories that I grew up with, because I grew up, you know, this, with this huge family and people always had stories and there's this colorful way of talking and relating and 
just characters. There are characters all over the place. And I never got to see any of that in anything that I watched. And so I went to film school to do that, thinking I was the first filmmaker that ever came out of Africa. Mm. Happily, that is not the case. There were many before me, but I didn't know that because none of their films were ever screened, at least in, you know, in the Anglophone countries. Francophone countries have a very long history of cinema um, that has been mostly funded by the French governments. And so, and then there's all these big festivals in Cannes and where in Europe mostly, but a lot of the Francophone countries did have cinema. The Anglophone countries did not. We had TV and it was British TV. And so I never got to see anything until way later in college, you know, when I got into film school. So I went to NYU because I studied Spike Lee and he went to NYU and I was like, great, I'll just go to NYU and they'll tell me what to do from there. Uh, I've never actually met Spike Lee, um, even though he teaches in the grad department, I went to undergrad, um, but he's, he was a huge influence on at least following that path in terms of like, all right, that's someone I can just, I'm gonna latch on to what he did, I'm just gonna, yeah, I'm just going to follow what he did. And, you know, in and, and the early days, he used to have like a companion book with all of his films. I think his first five films, he had like sort of his journal or something. So I got to read like what his journey was. And and then I went to try and do that. Um, and that was that was what brought me to film. Wow, Actually was trying awesome. to <laughs> trying to find something that I you we know, that looked right like around, me. You were at NYU. <laughs> We were working for Spike while you were at NYU. <laughs> yeah. Uh, exactly. Yeah, that's right. I was looking at your work, uh, mm -hmm. which is incredible. I'm so grateful. Yeah. yeah, and it's really wonderful that what we were doing influenced you and yeah. brought you into an industry that didn't have very many stories about us or have very many images that we felt were authentic. And that was mm -hmm. sort of what that wasn't sort of what it was what we were trying to do at 40 acres was yeah. to bring images to the screen that we don't see and bring yeah. people behind the scenes in in film that are not there and not you know exactly mostly we mis uh represented behind the camera yeah and so you know spike you know his whole his whole ideology uh is the same today as it was then you know and uplift the race and yeah. And, you know, that meant for you personally, you know, be the best filmmaker you can be. Also, collectively, we brought internships in and and on screen, you know, uh, Nola Darling, you know, was probably the first image a lot of young women and men saw of a black woman who was a romantic, who, you know, had love relationships, who was independent. Right. Um, so it was continuing, you know, a journey that that I think had fell off, you know, and from the 70s with black exploitation, and then, mm -hmm. you know, came back into the fray in the 80s, late 80s. But people, I don't think they really realize that, you know, our film life wasn't isn't that long. That it was, yeah, you know, in the 50s, and and that we were not. You know, we were in blackface and and we were uh, grossly misrepresented. And, you know, Oscar Michaud and the black cast films, you know, made it their business to put images on screen that they felt represented a class of African-Americans that, that you know, had dignity and pride. Yeah. And yeah. So it ebbed and flowed, you know, throughout yeah. For sure. So what are some projects that you felt like particularly proud of or very attached to that you've gotten to do during your career? Mm -hmm. um, Ava's Middle of Nowhere was yeah. um, beautiful, special because um, one of the things was it was right as Ava was just sort of cresting the hill. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was still, but it was still guerrilla. I mean, mm -hmm. It was straight up guerrilla filmmaking. Mm -hmm. And she was so brilliant, you know. 
including slicing tomatoes at lunch, you know, to put out on crafts on the on the lunch table. And wow. you know, we, we had no trailers and if you wanted privacy, you went you sat in your car for a little bit. There was one trailer. There was a, a curtain down the middle and half of it was the production office and the other half was for the actors, most of which were for the kids. So there was cartoons running all the time. And, oh. <laughs> um, and to see the, the images of that now, yeah. are, when, when she was done with that, when she put it all together, it was so beautiful. And of mm -hmm. course, Selma, and, well, Selma, hello. Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> Did we do Night John together? Oh, what was that? Who directed it? We did that one with Eric LaSalle, his independent film. Oh, that's where yeah. I first yeah, that's I came to your home. Oh, that's because I was trying to where did I meet when I first yeah, it was on Eric LaSalle's independent film. I don't even remember the name of it. Oh gosh. Um yes. Oh he'll he'll be so mad at me for not remember. <laughs> he's, he's my baby's goddaddy too. Oh. So oh, wow. I talk to, I talk to E all the time. Oh wow! Oh gosh, yes, I love that little film. Oh yeah, yes, and Eric, who's you know big showrunner right now, um, I loved, I loved that. I loved Selma. I loved. Um, there's a show I did on on Lifetime called Any Day Now. I'm really proud of. Um, I'm proud of it even more these days because of the things that we tackled in that in those four years that nobody has touched on television ever. Mm -hmm. The kinds of um, race agenda, the race relationship, and the agenda there was that Nancy Miller's her her intention was to out that each race was to be outed. It was going to get outed in that show. And we were going to talk about everything mm. that everybody is afraid to talk about mm. for so many different reasons, mostly feeling stupid or feeling unsure. We, we confronted it all in such an incredibly brave way. Um, mm. I was proud to be a part of that, that show. Um, Gosh, you know, I've, I've done more now than I can even remember what I've done. You know, like, oh, yeah, right. That was good too. I remember that. Um, I know. You know, when the, the 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 name of your of this of this series, Mind the Gap. It's I love that. I love that because. I, I I wanted to blog about that, and I'm gonna I'm gonna write the piece. I have a sort of a great idea for this this piece that goes under the heading of "Mind the Gap" because I was shooting um, a really w interesting show, visually interesting, of called "Into the Badlands." Mm -hmm. Costumes mm -hmm. visually, yeah. you'd love this route. I know. I mean, yeah. So rich. We shot it. I was living a year in Ireland, and we were shooting, shooting it sort of all through the back countries of Ireland in this wow. really wild huh. thing, post-apocalyptic with with a wonderful Italian designer who did the costumes. Um, but every time we got on and off the train, the conductor would say, "Mind the gap." Oh. Mind the gap. Yeah. <laughs> as a colonized preacher, I grew up. I grew up saying mind things. You, there were child minders, and you had to mind mind your manners, and you had to right. mind the pot, and you had to mind the children, and there was a lot of minding going on. <laughs> and so, but I, I Thank love. You. I thought a great deal about that phrase, mind the gap. Because it's so profound, that little phrase, because mm -hmm. the gap is the in-between, that crevice that you can fall into, but it also represents the void, which also represents the, the space of divine kind of creativity. That's the wound. The wound is the, is the, is, is the gap. 
and you have to, mm-hmm. and then you've got to mind it because you don't fall into it, you know. And it's, it, it's <laughs> a lot of stuff there with mind the gap. So, um, but that show in Ireland called um, Into the Badlands I played this odd prophetess, and but it was visually stunning, yeah. and um, it was an adventure. And I like departures from, I like surprising myself. Mm-hmm. And whenever I can, and the older I get, the more I surprise myself. And the kind of, the more I'm actually not interested in really knowing what I'm going to do mm-hmm. with something, I kind of map it out. And then I kind of, I'm discovering it at the same time as it's unfolding. That's, that's the really fun part of creating right now so Mm -hmm. um anything that surprises me orange is new black was the nice surprise that was a that was a (laughs) creative um yeah that was a jump that was a that was a good jump into a kind of a a creative well (laughs) dark well but a (laughs) but a but a fruitful one. I mean, yeah. it was creative it was, nonetheless. It was fertile on the on the on the other on the on the other side. You know, some yeah. things you go there, and then some things you go there. So, anything that pushes me, surprises me, is are the ones that are my favorites these days. Mm-hmm. I have so many children I'm proud of. Yeah. And, um, Malcolm X, um, Amistad. Mm. And um, Black Panther, I would say, are the top three. Um, Tina, Turner life's, Tina Turner's life story, also uh, near and dear. I mean, to be able to shepherd an actress through a journey like that, I mean, I pride myself on the connection I make with the actors and the story and their journey. And, you know, I care very deeply about, you know, their performance and how I can help support that. And so going through Tina Turner's life, you know, studying her life and then working with Angela Bassett and, you know, helping her um, by giving her the, the right, the appropriate, the most authentic looks for her journey uh, portraying uh, Tina Turner. Um, but, you know, on a deeper level, um, Malcolm X was... Uh, an interesting and fulfilling and and very rich journey um, to travel through Malcolm X's life with uh, Denzel Washington as the lead and Spike Lee as the director. Um, you know, taking the Hajj ourselves to to Mecca and uh, recreating a lot of the journey that Malcolm X um, had during that time that he was there um, was. Uh, a really profound experience. Um, we were even more than filmmakers when we were there. Um, it, it, you know, I, I was asked to, you know, arrange uh, uh, extras in a, in a small tent scene where, where El Haj Malik is praying next to uh, the blue eyed, blonde haired devil. And, you know, I got to pick that person out of our group and, bring them to the tent and, you know, there was a lot going on behind the scenes, you know, and how people got dressed and how we checked them in and checked them out. You know, I was the designer, so I wasn't as hands-on. I didn't speak, you know, the, the language, Egyptian. Um, but it was an Im- incredible experience. Um, being in Brooklyn at 40 Acres, Spike had just bought a, um, a, a car parking building, you know, in New York, you can drive, actually drive into a building and a, and a freight elevator takes your car up to a floor and you park. He bought one of those old buildings and we were the first to occupy it and it became the wardrobe department. So every floor was a different era, whether it was the 40s, the 50s, the 60s. Wow. And, um, you know, it was an incredible experience and, you know, uh, uh, same with Amistad, you know, going into Steven Spielberg's office and waiting for my interview with him. Um, he was doing Jurassic Park at the time. So he came by on his, uh, he arranged our meeting at his lunch uh, lunch hour. 
and I was waiting in the conference room. He came in, and the first thing he said was, I loved your work in Malcolm X. So, you know, that journey that I was on during those years was um, really profound in that it allowed me to uh, explore my creative side, my creative self, my creative journey. Um, I was supported, you know, and protected by black filmmakers. I bounced back and forth between Spike Lee and Robert Townsend, you know, for 10 years. Uh, I did one wow. film after the next, and then I, you know, broke through with Steven Spielberg and Amasa, but that had everything to do with Debbie Allen. You know, Debbie Allen brought me in to interview for that film. And yeah. so I'm, I'm continuing to be shepherded through black culture yeah. and, you know, to, a, you know, a culmination of Black Panther. And, mm. uh, you know, I'd never done a Marvel film before. So walking into their offices was like going into like the CIA, you know, I was like wondering, you know, what am I going to leave handcuffed in a paddy wagon? You know, is this a trick? Um, <laughs> So, but it was a, a, the complete opposite of that. You know, I walked into a room and I sat across from uh, Ryan Coogler and I had all these things to show him. Uh, and my Dropbox wouldn't open because they have a firewall. You just can't go into those um, public servers. So uh, I'm like kind of freaking out. And Ryan Coogler's across from me, the uh, executive, Nate Moore is also across from me. Nate leaves to go get his computer so I can log in on his computer. But while he's gone, Ryan Coogler says, you know, Ruth, I'm, I'm just so happy to see you. I'm, I'm, I'm ecstatic that you're st sitting here in front of me. And I'm like trying to impress him. And he says, I was a little boy when I went to see Malcolm X. My father took me to see Malcolm X. And I sat on his lap in the movie theater and as a child, I remembered the costumes. Wow. wow. So my life had wow. centered around the authenticity of wow. my work and my passion for yeah. what I do. And I felt like I had auditioned for Black Panther when that little boy, Ryan Coogler, was sitting on his dad's lap. And I'm very yeah. proud of that. I'm proud to hear you say that you know, school days influenced you to be a filmmaker, yes. Spike Lee. I mean, that's what we do this for. We do this for yes. for other people to, you know, to feel our experience and to be motivated mm -hmm. and inspired by it. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's so great. Ugh. I mean, for me, I... <sighs> You know, my my resume is not quite as long as these two lovely ladies yet, but my, as I mentioned earlier, my impetus for being a filmmaker was to be able to tell the stories of the people that I knew in the community that I come from, mm -hmm. and specifically East Africa, because while there's been films shot in East Africa for decades and decades, you know, big Hollywood films at that, um, East Africa in particular has, for the most part, been used as a location, um, you know, it's, so it's mostly focused on animals and landscapes, savanna landscapes, and then white people finding themselves amongst animals and savanna landscapes, and maybe some black person way in the corner, some Maasai person jumping around in the background, but you never really get to see, you know, like if you talk about West Africa or South Africa, or even North Africa, people do have images or, you know, some idea of some sort of language or some dance or some colors or, you know, like we've seen images of those things. Um, and I'm talking pre-digital now, you know, you can find a lot of things on YouTube, but for the most part, if you think West East Africa, people will tell you about Kilimanjaro, lions and Maasai, and that's pretty much it. And so for me, it's, that's always been just like, oh, my God, <laughs> we actually have people. They have lives. There's big, big, amazing lives. Like, oh, my God. And no, not all of us speak Swahili across the continent. <laughs> it's actually a very specific to East African language. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. You know, and so that was sort of one of my huge driving forces was just being able to tell stories about people mm -hmm. um, and 
and not be generic about it. Um, and so for all of my films, all of my film projects, I've you know done a bunch of short films. Um, one of the short films that I did, um, Soko Sonko, The Market King, was a film that I really, really love. It's very dear to me because it was a film that was inspired by the story of myself and my dad, um, who was a huge influence on me. My dad was an artist and he was, you know, one of the major forces of me being an artist, you know, in a, unlike a lot of my artist colleagues um, who were never encouraged to pursue art. I was the one person I know who was, you know, celebrated all the way to the finish line. And so I wanted to tell a story about me and my dad. And it's a, you know, it's a tiny little story about a man who has to take his daughter to get her hair braided um, when his when her mom is sick, and you know it's a fairly simple setup, um, but it's kind of this father daughter adventure, and again, just wanting to be able to not only talk about people, but because my dad is such a huge influence on me. That's the other thing too in the representation of our people, um, the misrepresentation of our people, which has happened for a long time. Um, there's ways that women have been represented in terms of African stories. It's mostly, you know, the, the trouble and the FGM or the Boko Haram or, the, you know, just all like the issues that face women in various parts of the continent. Um, and for men, you know, and this is not just Africa, but really all over the diaspora, the way that men are portrayed and not so much, you know, I'm not trying to necessarily change the portrayal for the sake of others, you know, so that you can see us as this way, but um, really thinking about how it affects the way that we see ourselves um, when the only image that we see of ourselves is of men who don't care and men who, you know, are beating up their wives and selling off their daughters and, you know, philandering or whatever it is. Um, without any kind, you know, without any kind of explanation even as to why those things happen. Cause you know, men do horrible things as do several women as well. Um, so it's also not just sort of like making everybody wonderful and we're all skipping through lilies. We have our issues and we have our challenges, but just kind of like making it more three dimensional has been like very important for me. So for the market king, that was sort of like a step where we got to, I love that film, it's a comedy. Um, and I, you know, I made that film, I think in 2014, but it still is a film that has played and continues to play all over the place. And it's a film that men particularly really enjoy watching because they get to kind of laugh at themselves <laughs> in a way that's really sweet. Um, you know, cause it's a man who's just fighting for his, his daughter and he loves his family and he's, making a lot of really like silly mistakes along the way. Um, and then of course my feature, Farewell Amour, um, is, you know, I, I struggled for so many years being a filmmaker who has, you know, my influence has been to tell stories about Africans. Um, and as I mentioned, most stories about Africans that is funded by um, Americans or Europeans tends to center around the American or European part of the story. And then the Africans get to support the European part of the story. Um, and so it was really difficult for me to find any funding or investors for anyone who would help me to make a film about that was set in Africa. And so Farewell Amour was sort of like, okay, well, there's a lot of Africans in the diaspora and I'll tell that kind of a story. And so it's set in Brooklyn. Um, and but wanting to be really really authentic and so that my characters happen to be angolan i'm not angolan i've never been to angola um but i do love the culture and as somebody who's had their culture misrepresented so many times <laughs> and that's what i was telling you um in camera miss Car miss ruth before we started our conversation about you know, just the kind of joy that it brought me to see your work in Black Panther um, and knowing, you know, the specificity of the accents that they had in that film, the specificity. I did write an open letter that I have on my website um, just in praise of Ryan Coogler and the work that he did because 
the first time I saw the movie. I've seen it many times. I remember just leaving there thinking like, I wonder how many battles he had trying to fight for that kind, that level of specificity, because you don't get to see that easily yes. um, when it comes to our work and when it comes to trying to explain to people who have been in the industry longer or know better or have more money or whatever the case is that like we're not all alike it's not just one lump of generally brown looking people in generally you know colorful clothing in some sort of language that isn't english but it's some version of english it's like no it's 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 very very specific you know and people and I, look very specific and I too love that he was very um animate about having that creative yeah. so it, it took them a while to convince him to do black panther because he didn't want mm. to do that other version mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah and it's i mean it's such a joy to be in a time now where it seems like there's a little bit more space for us to actually do that and even if the people who are supporting us or funding us don't necessarily understand everything it's like it's fine you'll catch up we understand what we're doing. We understand the specifics of seeing a light-skinned Black woman, you know, on the screen and what that represents, or seeing a beautiful, well-dressed, fancy Vogue woman and what that represents, and seeing, you know, just all of the different things, the particulars in language, the particularities in accents, and like how we say the words or the mind the gap, the choice of words that we do, you know, and so for all of the work that I've done, those are things that I've tried to be very specific about because it means something to us. You know, I remember when we saw, when Black Hawk Down came out, which was kind of a big deal because it was East Africa, it was Somalia, and there was, what are they going to say about it? And I mean, aside from the movie itself, they just had like a bunch of random Black people running around, like screaming like, Farah Hadid! And it was just like, <laughs> Those are not Somali people. The Somali people look like Somali people. Like you cannot just interchange with any other brown face and just get away with it. Like yeah. they are looking, they look very specific. They speak a very specific way and you have to do that, you know, and there's no need. There isn't, it's not like you can't find any Somalis anywhere. There is no need for us to be just kind of like pushing people and, you know, we're past blackface. We get to do other things now. So so that's what I'm excited to do, to continue wow. doing with my work. That's exciting. That's exciting. Yeah. That yeah. brings me to my final question, which is essentially based on stuff that you both seen and also worked on in the beginning and the stuff that you're doing currently. So like, for instance, you were mentioning your future for Alan Moore. Ruth is working on Coming to America and the Dolomite, which was at the festival last year. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, Lorraine has the glorious coming out um, really soon. So like, uh, I wanted to know what have you seen has changed in terms of like what you used to watch and like stuff that you did early in your career and now, like in terms of the images you're seeing on screen? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll stick, uh, I'll go first. Um, technology has made uh, a lot more available to mm -hmm. us. And so I don't necessarily, I'm not locked into a channel. I'm not locked into a network. I can go to my computer. I can research a film and actually view it at, at uh, you know, at any time. And I think that's one of the real positive things that has happened, you know. Um, I can look up people, any filmmaker, director, and just, you know, do my own film festival of their work, you know, and watch it on, 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 you know, our screens are bigger, you know, we some have screening rooms where, you know, it's, it's a little sad that the movie going experience has been divided. Um, but it's also nice that we have so many more choices that the world is so much more open to us. Mm -hmm. Sure. It's, it's made it's it's made um, so much more work for us possible to all of these these many platforms and and whereas before the small screen was a place where you know you, you were you you got to the second small screen because you couldn't quite make it on the big screen mm -hmm. it's not that way at all 
and um, there, in fact, it's it's almost it's it's been the opposite certainly since COVID, and um, like the glorious is premiering, I believe today, on Amazon. Um, and uh, when you were talking about the going through the sixties, I I and you would have liked this. Um, I play Flo Kennedy, who was an outrageous activist in Love the fifties and sixties. Yeah, Sister Flo Flo Kennedy. Um, but I find now that because of the the many platforms that we are able to invent and reinvent ourselves and tell our stories um, in so many so many different places now. I mean, I was looking at Lovecraft County, you know, and we're breaking all kinds of barriers now. I mean, you know, black people in the horror genre, that is that is brand new with Jordan mm -hmm. Peele. I mean, he has really um, delivered us full force into that genre in a way that is still <laughs> incredibly authentic to black people and the way in which we approach stuff that's horrific and scary and you know that including all of the stereotypes of oh no 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 we're black we would never be in that situation um no we would run run baby run. very short movie <laughs> yep um, his incredible sense of humor and and um irony in 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 his very particular style that he's um, he's ushered us into um, some of the work I'm I'm doing um, I'm doing a bunch of things at the moment I'm, I'm finishing up something for Showtime where I'm playing a judge I'm, I've got a, something at Amazon where it's a post-apocalyptic where it's a, based on the film Fast Color I did a couple of years ago that was a terrific film and, um, again we were, we never, we were never cast in in, in, in post-apocalyptic films, in films in space, films in the future. We were always mm -hmm. in service to the white characters. We were always the friend of. We were mm -hmm. never the, the featured characters or the featured storyline. We were never the A storyline. And, um, you know, I was, you know, Kerry Washington, I mean, she has moved the needle in, in so many different, so many actors and actresses it was awfully hard to move the needle in the early years yeah. that I was coming up, but I'm yeah. watching it get moved drastically yeah. now. And I, yeah. I'm excited to see in this era, in, 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 in the Black Lives Post, no, it will never be post, and hopefully one day it will be post Black Lives Matter, but there is a focus now with the shift in the academy in terms of the criteria for um, academy films now, which I think is extraordinary and exciting and correct because Hollywood may be finally catching up with the world in terms of the images that, that actually reflect the world as it is today, not just the United States, but the world. And, and with the advent of all of these, of the internet and technology, these films are crossing the, the, the oceans in an instant so that marketing and 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 um uh distribution those kinds of concerns well will these films make money overseas that you push a button yeah. and they're overseas yeah right and so i think all of these things are changing the myth the false myth that black people can't make money and mm -hmm. so much of this industry is financially driven. And so we are proving that we are money. <laughs> I mean, Ruth Carter is sitting here with her Oscar, you know, and, you know, and Black Panther made how much money? $1.5 billion. billion dollars. Yeah. This is the stuff that moves the needle, right? And so I think we're about especially with, with these mandates for the Academy now, if you want to have your film be eligible to be okay. best film, yeah. Yeah. you, you got to make some serious fundamental yeah. changes. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. 
I think we're about to step into a more conscious uh, creative time in terms of filmmakers and white filmmakers, most especially producers and filmmakers, because I hope, because I'm an optimistic human being, some of this I'm going to trust is not, is not intentional, but it is ignorance and it is thoughtlessness. And mm -hmm. so now, if nothing else, people are going to have to be thoughtful, right. and conscious when they are mm -hmm. writing, creating, casting, producing these films. Yes, so absolutely. I think we're moving into an exciting time. I look forward to all of absolutely. us thriving and absolutely. raising have yet to. Yes. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. I agree. And I think, you know, for me, you know, going off of what you were saying, Miss Ruth, about like the digital era and what that's ushered in, part of that for me is our being able to see ourselves and have conversations with each other across borders, across oceans, in a way that music kind of did early on, you know, like our music kind of moved around. And so you have similar, you know, sort of like, these are people over here made this music and then somebody got a tape over here and it inspired this. And then they came back with this other version of Calypso and it came back and it was Zook and it came back and it was Compa and it, you know, like all of these different things. And I feel like we're doing that with film and with images now where people are kind of like talking to each other and answering each other in terms of like the visuals that they're seeing, be it, you know, photography and Instagram and, and movies and videos and just sort of like, you know, cause we're also very visual people, um, you know, in terms of like how we see color and how we deal with rhythm and how we deal with, you know, like we just, we kind of experience things a little bit differently. And so it's really lovely to see that Mm -hmm. um, and to see that being expressed in so many different ways. And I think, you know, a lot of people, when I was in school sort of coming out for most young black visual people, the first stop was making music videos because that's kind of like the only place you could get in without, you know, an agent. And, you know, if you had like a little camera, you could kind of do some things. And I think that was kind of an incubation period where people were able to like really experiment and do some really interesting things. Um, and in a medium that we're already like, that's just kind of our, that's kind of our thing. Music is already our thing. So <laughs> now we're just adding other stuff on top of that, which is great. Um, and for me personally, I think it's also just being able in the midst of all of that to, to really like develop my voice because, you know, I remember being in film school and you know, people being like, oh, well, you can't say that. And that that's not how things are done. And nobody will da, 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 da. And, you know, this is, this is, you know, this is the model that we uphold, you know, like if you're making a film, it needs to be either French New Wave or it needs to be Italian, blah, blah, blah. Or it needs to be, you know, these are the examples and none of those examples ever, you know, included any people that I knew. Spike Lee was nice. But no, but it was just like, you'll learn about that in black studies, <laughs> going back to the film grades, you know, it was, or it was kind of this like, he's amazing. I can't tell you why he's amazing, but he's amazing because he's black <laughs> and he's the one black person that we've ever included in any of our books. But now there's just, there's Spike is amazing. And there's all these other people who've come up to and have been influenced by him and he influenced them or they influence him. all of the things, you know, we're speaking to each other. So for me, it's also about like being able to find my own voice as opposed to the voice that was, you know, sort of expected of me or given to me or sort of like, you know, train like, well, if you're going to tell an African story, it should be within these parameters because otherwise we don't understand that. Um, and that's definitely something that I experienced again with Farewell Amour is, you know, even just the idea of having people speaking with accents that aren't the African accent. There is no such thing, by the way, um, <laughs> you know, because they're Portuguese speakers. Most people don't have that ear for it. Mm -hmm. And I did, I made a point of not putting on any subtitles because I was like, well, they are speaking English, but also if you don't have an ear to understand them, you can watch it because it's a visual medium and 
do the work to figure out what they are saying. I promise you, you will, you will do it, you know? And so for me, it's being able to <clears throat> find my voice, which I think has developed and I'm proud to say has developed since then. And to do that in the midst of this, you know, revolution and evolution that's taking place with all of us black creators where we're able to not just focus outward on sort of like what we look like to everybody else and making sure that, you know, we're prim and we're proper and we're buttoned up and, you know, we're not misrepresenting our people, but that we can also look at each other, look at ourselves and look at each other. Like, wow, look at what they're doing over there and, you know, in Europe and look at what they're doing on the continent, look at what they're doing in the Caribbean. And, you know, like, look at all these people, then we can like kind of talk to each other and have our own conversations like this, um, where we're sharing ideas and, you know, kind of like, wow, that really worked really well for how you did it. Maybe I should try that and, you know, have like a slight shift this way. And in that way, similar to music, I really do think that we are going to be leading the, um, the, in the industry I mean, I think we already are, but it's just not, it's harder to see because with film, like there's always that money element of how expensive everything is. So it doesn't feel like we're leading much. Um, but in terms of influencing the way things change, I mean, Black Panther being a wonderful example of just like 2018, when that film came out, it was just like, we can't make another movie the same way. Like we, we can't think about filmmaking. We can't think about black people on screens. We can't think about natural hair. We can't think about costuming. We can't think about any of these things in the same way. Everything needs to be scrapped. We need to start from scratch, do it, you know? So I'm excited about that. I'm very excited about that. So unfortunately we are out of time. No. This was an absolutely amazing <laughs> conversation. Thank you all for joining us and thank you so much to everyone who's watching this. Um, yeah. uh, thank you for joining us in Mind the Gap. There are uh, other amazing roundtables, so please check them out. And thank you for watching. Bye. Uh, bye, you guys. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>